I'm going to start talking this morning about something that I think I'm going to carry on with next week. I'm qualifying it that way so that I would get a, a reputation as being an untruthful pastor. But in principle, that's what I'm thinking about doing. And so um, I want to, we, we started speaking a few weeks ago about righteousness and the importance of righteousness and what righteousness is and why it's valuable to us. Actually, I think we started last week. Um, and so I want to carry on with that, but um, let's just jump in and look at, if you have a look at John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. I don't like that translation. Sorry, I should, I should try the King James. Um, I think that's a better one. Anyway, but that's what it says. So there are a few things. I want to break this down because I think the, the King James Version is a better one. And so there are a few things about this that I want to touch on. God is telling us something in that verse, which at, at, at a macro level, what he's sitting saying is this. I've given you who I am. I've introduced my life to you. And I've given you everything that you need to be able to allow that life to, be, to, to flow through you and to read define who you are, to introduce you to who you are as a son of God, a mature spiritual person. So the whole premise of God of God's um, pre presentation to us here is to sit and say, what I've given to you is to do something in your life. It's, it's intended to have influence in who you are and change you for, from who you are. God never came to live in your life simply to take up a habitation. He came in there, and I think one of the biggest things and one of the most important things we can probably ever spend time thinking about is the fact that we have the same life in us that God has. That's the most amazing thing. We spoke last week about the fact that we are divine, but we're not deity. Okay, so we're not, we don't get worship, but we, we have elements of God on the inside of who we are. And so there are parts to us who are divine. And because God put that on the inside of us, he's basically introducing us to the idea that we need to become a brand new creation. We need to live as a brand new creation. And so he says, if I, I'm going to break it into three parts. I think that might be easiest. Um, but as many as received him, but as many as received him. What he's talking to is, if you're born again, he's speaking to you. If you're born again, you're, you're the one he's talking to because you have received him. And because you've received him, you are an experiencer of something that they call incarnational reality. I know it's such a really big term, but what it means is this, God taking on human form. Incarnational reality is God taking on human form. God sitting saying, you know what? I want to come and I want to not only live with you, but live amongst you. God moving into that realm. And it, what's interesting about it is we have as much of the incarnation of God as Jesus had. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. It's true. Go to, I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. You have as much as the incarnation as what God, when God put his life inside of Jesus, that's the same life that you have on the inside of you. And it becomes consequential because Jesus said, the things that I do, I don't do of myself. It's the father inside of me that do, doeth the works. What he's saying is he was going back to the significance and the importance of the life of God on the inside of him and how it has influence in those realms what it does in those realms and how he's able to take spiritual truths and introduce them into the natural realm. What's interesting about it is this. Jesus is to become the model for who we are. The thing is, Jesus lived righteously. He lived in the image of God and he behaved from that place. And the thing is, we have as much righteousness as Jesus has. We have the same nature that Jesus had, but we can't do the same works that Jesus can do. You can potentially, but you're not doing them. And this is there anybody out here who is. So what he's saying is this. We are called to grow in, stat, in, in stature like Jesus is. 
We are called to be like him. So we're on a journey of growth. We're on a journey of development. We're on a journey where we're able, we're learning what it is to become spiritual people, what it is to engage the spirit dimension, the life of God on the inside of us, our ability to be able to take God and introduce God into our world. We don't do it to the degree that Jesus did it. And so we're growing in our capacity and our ability to do that. It's a big change for us and it's a big shift because we're so comfortable and we're so climatized to being natural people that we really don't know what it is to be spiritual people. But it's a completely different dimension. God's invitation to us is the fact that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. What he's saying is you need to know what it is to be able to live in this realm. The natural realm is consequential. It's important. Go and get an education. Do all the stuff that's necessary to be successful in the natural realm. But he doesn't limit us to the natural realm. Although you're in that, what his invitation is, I want you to be able to recognize the life that I've put on the inside of you, be able to engage that life, let that life have influence in you, in you, redefine who you are, and introduce you to what it is to be able to take that and bring it into my world. I'm I'm learning what it is to become a spiritual creature and how to live from spirit. So he says to us, the first thing he says is, if you have received him, then he's given you power to become something. He's given you the power to become something. One thing that's always important to realize with God is that he is so good and he is always an expression of grace. What he means is this, everything that he wants for you, he provides for you, even how to get there. So he gives you his life and he says, now what I'm going to do is I want for you to become an expression of that life, but I don't want you to do it because your ability to be able to do it is not going to be what I can do. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my power so that you can become something. When God says he's giving us his power, what he's talking about doing is giving us his righteousness. We spoke last week about righteousness and what righteousness actually is. And the easiest way to really understand it is this. God is the center of his realm. He is the center of his spiritual universe. So everything in God's realm comes from God. God is the source of everything. And so God is not righteous because of what he does. God is righteous because of who he is. So God walks in righteousness because everything that he, that is around him, everything that he participates in is righteous, but everything that God does becomes righteous because it becomes an expression of who he is. And so righteousness carries power with it because it emanates from the nature of God. Are you with me this morning? Okay, so it comes from God's nature. And so the thing is, when God says to you, I'm going to give you power to become something, what he's saying is, I'm going to take who I am, I'm going to take something of myself and my nature, and I'm going to give it to you. It's called righteousness. Righteousness in the Bible is referred to as a weapon. It's part of the armor of God. And the reason that it's a weapon is because it comes with power. The whole point about righteousness is righteousness doesn't only let us live the way that God wants us to live so that we live a life that is pleasing to him, but righteousness comes with power to overcome sin. So every time you have something that come against God's way of living, every time you come against, something comes against God's way of how he wants you to live, he has given you the power to overcome that. It's his righteousness. It's not yours. Something that's so important for us to be, be, become aware of is I really want you to meditate on righteousness because I cannot tell you how important it is because righteousness is the foundation for God's love for you. Righteousness is the foundation for God's love for you. Because he loved you so much, he's given you his righteousness and his righteousness opens the door to all the possibilities of his love expressions in your life. Not only is it the foundation to his love for you, but it also is the foundation of faith. When you understand who you are as a righteous person, when we understand the fact that God has created me to be a righteous person and to live from that righteousness, and he's given me the power to be able to influence everything outside of who I am that comes against that righteous way of living, I begin to recognize the fact that power translates into delegated authority into what I will move into. 
It's the foundation of righteousness. Righteousness is so important in our lives. Righteousness. So he's given us the power to become something. And he speaks about us becoming the sons of God. Not the children of God. The sons of God. There is a big difference. Sons of God speaks about maturity. I touched on this a few weeks ago. The minute that you got born again, you became a child of God. Why? Because you were born of his nature. He came and his life is on the inside of you. The thing about it is he doesn't call us to stay as a child. He calls us to become sons. And what he says is, I have given you who I am, and I'm going to give you my righteousness, the power to become something else, to become mature in who I am. Not to be a son all of your, a child all of your life, to, but to step into sonship. Sonship. Sonship is important because sonship speaks about our maturing in the things of God. So what does it mean? One thing that it means is this. We need to move to a place where we become more and more comfortable with the fact that there is a spirit dimension. And being able to differentiate between the spirit dimension and the natural dimension. Everything that God does has its origins and its, and its root in the spirit dimension. That's where it starts. So if I, if I do not understand that realm and I don't know what it is to access that realm, I leave myself at a place where I'm not able and capable of accessing the things of God and living from the things of God. So my ability be, to become overtly aware of the fact that there are two realms and be intentional about engaging that realm and beginning to understand that realm becomes so important for me and my spiritual maturity. There are two realms. One of the biggest things that I would suggest to you is this. Be careful because there's a deception. And it's so clever, but it's so deceptive. And it's this. Taking spiritual truth and putting it into the natural realm and thinking that you're a spiritual person. The thing is, you can take spiritual truth and you can put it into the spiritual realm and it's still right, but it's just powerless. Let me give you an example. It's important for you to study the words of God. It's important for you to study the Bible. It's very important for you to do that. But it's more important for you to pray. Why? Because I can study the words of God in the natural realm and have absolutely no spiritual influence. What's happening? What I'm doing is right. The problem with it is it's got no power. There are plenty of people who are philosophers who study the word of God all the time because it adds to their philosophy. So they have a predisposition towards enlarging their capacity to understand and to reason, but they have no power. If you want power, you have to be able to take what is here and, put, and take it into the spirit arena. How do I do that? Through prayer. The reason that I've encouraged people to embark on a 90-day, uh, one hour a day pray prayer is for this very reason. What are we doing? I'm beginning to engage the spirit dimension. I don't have to engage the spirit dimension to study or read my Bible or listen to a tape. It's a good thing. I'm not saying don't do it because you're going to get some stuff from it. But unless I take what I get from it and I go to him and I get together with him, what happens is it's got no life. So I can learn here what it is to be a person who is joyful and happy and a person who lives from um, peace, patience, all the elements of, I can learn about all of that stuff. And what I can do is because there's no spiritual power there, I default to management. So what I do is I try and manage myself because I know this is what a good Christian should be. And so what happens is I haven't become new. I'm exactly the same, but now I've got management on it. I'm taking care of it. But God said, I'm not calling you to manage your life. I'm calling you to take that and to come into a dimension where you sit and say, you've promised me that you're going to give me peace. You've promised me joy. Where is that? I can't make it happen, but he can. So what am I doing? I'm taking something which is a truth and I'm bringing it into the spirit dimension. I'm sitting saying, this is something that you've promised me. I'm coming to you and I'm asking for you to make this a truth and a reality in my life. I don't want to try and pretend to be peaceful. I want to experience peace. Yeah. 
I want it to be a living, vibrant truth inside of who I am. Only he can do that. So I'm beginning to recognize the importance of, I can make discoveries in the natural, but if you want the power behind that discovery, you're going to have to take it to him, which means the reason that I begin to pray is because it's about engagement with him. It's a bridge between the natural realm and the spirit realm. And as I begin to get into that realm, what ends up happening is I start to explore who he is. I think prayer is very much like raising kids. I'll tell you why. When you first have a baby, what is what defines that whole episode is the baby. It's all about me. Feed me, clothe me, sleep me, take care of me, look after me, uh, feed me again, change me, entertain me. Everything's me, 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 me. And so when we start off with prayer, we usually start at an elementary level, which is all about me. God, I've come to you because my life, I've got some problems. So I need you to do some stuff in my life. It's okay. We all start there. It's fine. This is not a criticism of everybody. Just laugh and then they'll think that you're much further along the road than anybody else. But we start off there. And so we start praying for my needs. The problem with it is this. It's still all about me at the center. It's really not about him. But the thing is, when I start to engage prayer from a different perspective and a different level, and I recognize that prayer is nothing more than an opportunity for me to begin to engage who he is and discover him in a different realm, that prayer offers me the opportunity to elevate myself from the natural realm and begin to engage the spirit arena, I open myself up to his influence in my life. And I get it to that place where it's like, I'm not trying to find out right now what you can do for me but i want to know who you are let's talk a little bit about tell me about your righteousness this thing that you've given to me this power to transform me and to change me and to give me everything that i need so that i can become the fullness of who you've called me to be and i can live from places of power and authority talk to me about that what does it look like What is it going to be like in my life? Speak to me about the fact that you've put inside of me your very life, the life that's in the Holy Spirit, the life that's in Jesus, the life that's in the Father, the thing that makes them three and one and one and three. You put it in me. Show me something about that. Show me something I've never seen before. It becomes an exercise in discovery and exploration. Now you're getting to a better place where prayer is far more effective because now it's not just about meeting my needs, but it's about discovering who he is. Who are you? To know him in the power of his resurrection. You move into that place when you start to discover who he is and you start to realize what he's all about. It opens up avenues and opportunities for us to walk into different dimensions of who he is become so important for us. And so the journey that we're on as spiritual people is being able to become aware of the spiritual realm, access the spiritual realm, and ultimately what spiritual maturity translates into is my ability to introduce the spirit realm into the natural. That's what Jesus did. Jesus lived from being able to take that which is spiritual and introduce it and change his world. The reason it becomes important is this. As we grow, it opens the door and the opportunity for us to be entrusted with the kingdom. Kingdom is important because kingdom is a standing and a place where you have authority and you can exercise that authority. So kingdom becomes important. So if you have a look at John chapter 3, Nicodemus is coming to Jesus. And he says something interesting because his approach to Jesus is this. Tell me how it is that you do the miracles that you do. He didn't refer to him as the savior. He didn't ask him, how do I get born again? That's not how Nicodemus approached him. Nicodemus approached Jesus and said, I see something different about you. The way that you live and what happens in your life and what you're able to introduce into this dimension, this realm, this natural realm, the way that things obey you and situations and circumstances change. Nobody can do that unless God is with them. Tell me, where does this come from? 
And Jesus is something interesting to him. He says, firstly, unless a man get born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What he's saying is this. When you come to that place where you recognize your need for a savior, it opens the door for the life of God to come and to reside on the inside of who you are. All of a sudden, you become a temple. The life of God is inside of me. Potential exists. But potential could sit there forever and never be tapped. There are many Christians who die with the life of God on the inside of them, and all they've ever experienced of him is the fact that they've become a new creation in Christ. It never extended more than that. They've never learned how to tap into what is alive on the inside of them. They've never learned the significance of that and how to to engage him at that level so that that dimension has influence in their life. Because Jesus goes on and says, this is not just about seeing the kingdom, but he says, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to be born of the spirit and born of the water. Basically the word and the water. What is he saying? Every time you recognize something which is a promise of God and you come to him and you sit and say, I see this in your word and this is what you've promised me. I'm looking for you to introduce peace into my life. I'm looking for an opportunity to enter the kingdom in that arena. What am I saying? I don't want to look like I'm a peaceful person. I want you to introduce it into my life. That is a quality and it's a characteristic of kingdom life. And so unless you birth that into me, I can't step into the kingdom. But when you birth it inside of me, all of a sudden I step into peace and I step into the fullness of what that's all about. It's not something that I'm trying to model. It's not something that I'm trying to look like. It's not something that I'm having a look at and I'm trying to manage. It's a truth that's established on the inside of me. And when I live from that place, It's powerful. Now I'm understanding what it is to move into kingdom reality and to kingdom truth. The reasons that kingdom becomes so important, the reason that our our ability to be able to get involved with and connect with the life on the inside of us is that it is totally transformational. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. My God shall supply all of my needs. You know what that means? The glory is the God realm. Glory is the God realm. That's where God exists. And so what it's saying is, God will meet all of your needs according to his abilities that exist in the God realm. The the life of God is on the inside of you. If you want to tap into what God has for you, it's dependent on our ability to tap into that realm. If I can't tap into that realm, I don't get to realize the blessings that he has for me. His blessings are not out there. His blessings are in the God realm. So my ability to be able to connect with him and to connect with him at that level becomes really important for me. God is ultimately looking for our lives to mirror what Jesus did. What it means is this, we are really to become the message. We should be living the message. That is what spiritual maturity is all about. Where I go and the things I do and the way that I live should model what it is to have God alive on the inside of who I am. We should have Nicodemus coming to our door. How is it that you do these things that you do? We're to model that. It's called the spirit life. There's a big transition that takes place because I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. And so the more I become aware of the fact that God is wanting to have influence in my life and I begin to position my life in that way, it creates an opportunity for him to influence me in that way. Let me me have a look at um, 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says this. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. So what I want to talk to you about is this. 
I believe that there is a relationship that exists between righteousness and the promises of God so that we can experience his nature. So what does that all look like? Righteousness is the ability, is, is part of God's nature that lets us walk like God and exert power over anything that comes against that. So let's have a look at something that will give us an idea as to how this works. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. I don't know, I think I have it here somewhere. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. So we come to this place where we've been drawn by the Holy Spirit. We've come to a place where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit has been ministering to us because unless you're drawn by the Holy Spirit, you never get born again. Everybody who's got born again has been drawn by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. So the point, he's been working on you and he's been ministering to you and he's been drawing you. And so he gets you to the place where all of a sudden you recognize the fact that, you know what? I want to have the life of God on the inside of me. Ezekiel 36, 20, uh, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Okay, this is, l- let, me, let me dissect this a little bit. You come and you sit and say, you know what? I want to get born again. I want the life of God on the inside of me. I feel a sense of conviction about that. And it's like, I really, I I want relationship with God. What is the first thing that happens? The first thing that happens is righteousness kicks in. Righteous comes in and says, you know what? Okay, all of this stuff that is unclean right now, we need forgiveness and let's get it out of here. So let's make you brand new. So I become a brand new person person. And as a result of having a new spirit and a new heart on the inside of me, it positions me at a place where all of a sudden righteousness is in the same condition as God. God's not moving in when there's sin in the place. God's moving in when the sin is gone. So righteousness moves in first because what righteous does is it cleans it all up. It says everything that used to be is gone. You're a brand new creation right now. And as a brand new creation, I have a new spirit and I have a new heart. So I'm clean. I'm ready. And because of that, God says, because you're righteous, I'm going to give you the promise and I will put my life on the inside of who you are. And all of a sudden, God's life comes inside of me. I become a brand new creation and he gave me the promise of his life and he put it on the inside of me. Now he's given me something that I can live from that I never had before. So from a spiritual dimension, what ends up happening is because he gave me the promise, he's given me the potential to become a partaker of the divine nature that's inside me. Is that okay? Okay. I just want to make sure I haven't lost you because you're kind of like looking at me like, where are you going? Okay. But now listen, what I want to suggest to you is this. It's the principle for how God deals with us. Very often you have so many people sit and say, you know what, I'm glad that I've got the life of God on the inside of me, but it really doesn't matter how I live. What I'm proposing to you today is this, it matters significantly how you live. Sometimes people sit and say, okay, well, I know I shouldn't be doing this because this really isn't right, but it doesn't matter. I'll just like repent from it. Child, children do that. They do stuff that's wrong all the time and they're continually asking for forgiveness. God will forgive you, but you live as a child. Part of becoming a son means that I grow up a little bit and I recognize, you know what? There is a much bigger calling on my life right now. And there's something far more significant and weighty on my life. And I can't just keep messing around and playing around like a little child. I have to leave some stuff behind because I'm moving into sonship. And when I'm moving into sonship, I recognize that there is a much bigger call on my life than just being able to indulge my flesh in what it is that I want to do. Colossians 3.3 says, I've died and my life is hidden with Christ Jesus in God. What it means is I became a brand new creation. And when I became a brand new creation, I really have no clue of who I am because I died back there. I knew who that person was, but I don't know who the new person is. But as I begin to to discover and as I I get more and more with the nature of, of that's on the inside of me and I allow it to influence me, every time I make a discovery about the nature on the inside of me, I've just discovered something new about myself. 
Every time I learn something new about the life that's alive and vibrant on the inside of me, I've discovered something new about who I am as a new creation in Christ. It's a new opportunity for, for me to live from a different place than I lived before. God is doing stuff in us all the time. So the point is this. Every time God wants to work in your life, that's how he's going to work. There is a principle. Righteousness creates a space for the blessing to come on. And as a result of that, it positions me in a place of power to live from that space. Let me give you some examples. Jesus. Jesus says in John 6, verse 38, he says, I only do the will of the Father who sent me. I only do the will of the Father who sent me. That is really important. If you want to find a driver for your life that positions you in a place where you're going to be successful with God, get the will of God. Follow the will of God. Righteousness is really the power that allows us to experience and for God to inculcate his, his will into my life. It runs over everything else that stands in the way of that. Righteousness entrenches me and gets me established in the will of God. I'm talking about taking the life of God that's on the inside of us now and rolling it out. Rolling it out into the way that I think, the way that I feel, the way that I behave, the way that I speak. All of those things are changing. Why? Because every time God's walk, God moves into a realm, he's not happy just being a latent power that's sitting in the, on the inside there. He wants who he is to redefine everything in that environment. When he moved into your life, that is what he's looking to do. Redefine everything from the inside out in accordance with who he is. So what is he doing? So Jesus says, I only did the will of the father who sent me. His life was characterized by what, what the father had called him to do. So he lived a lifestyle from righteousness that introduced on an ongoing basis the Father's will in his life. So it was interesting because when he went and he was going to get baptized by John, he gets baptized and he comes up and all of a sudden there's a voice. God spoke. And what did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well. Why was he well pleased in him? I only do the will of the Father who sent me. My life is dedicated and committed to something bigger than who I am. My life is controlled, um, driven, and influenced solely by the will of God. And because of that, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the result of that was the promise, the Holy Spirit and power. The challenge with it is this. Anytime we want to live by our own will and not the will of God, we cause friction, uh, 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 we, we fragment away from where God is. And what I'm proposing to you today is this. If you want to experience the authority and the power that God has for you, we have to align with God. Anytime we want to live our lives the way that we want to live them, it's fine. You can go ahead and do that, but there's no power in that place and God's not going to entrust it to us. So in Luke chapter one, the angel appears to Mary and says, Mary, I've got, I've got to tell you something. You're just like so favored beyond what you can imagine. I'll tell you why. Because God wants to do something through you. And he begins to speak to her about the will of God. This is the will of God. This is what God wants to do. And she says what? In verse 38, so be it unto me according to your word. What was she saying? She was saying, it's important for me to align my life with what it is that you want. And as a result of aligning her life with what he wanted, the promise was given and she conceived. Abraham, in the Old Testament, he lived his life in a way that was pleasing to God. And God had a plan and a purpose for him. And God met with him and God spoke to him about, Abraham, you know what? I know there's a lot of stuff going on and I know there's a whole bunch of considerations and issues and challenges and problems and all the rest. But I'll tell you what, I want to make you the father of many nations. I want to make you the father of many nations. And it says, and Abraham believed God. If you look at Romans chapter three, verse four, it says, um, Abraham's, Belief in God was counted to him as righteousness. 
You know what it means? It means Abraham got to that place where he sat and said, you know what? It's more important for me to align myself with the will of God. And so what I'm doing is I'm stepping into this place which positions me in righteousness. And when I step into this place of righteousness because I'm living in the way that God wants me to do, the promise came and he ended up being the father of many nations. We cannot separate the way we live from receiving the promises of God. It's incongruent. It's incongruent. Everything that God has called us to do is not so that it can live latently on the inside of us, but it's going to be, it's going to be something that comes out of that and affects every part of who we are. Every part of who we are. Psalm 103, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless his holy name. Do you know what that means? I'll tell you. Thanks for asking. (laughs) It means this. God put his life on the inside of who you are. And when I come to the place where I recognize the value of who he is, and I open my life up and I allow his will to begin to influence who I am and redefine who I am. When I allow who he is and his nature to come in and make me a new creation experientially in my life, I get to the place where I say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and every part of me that has become an expression of who he is, praise his name. Why? Because it's not about a God who's just dead on the inside of me. It's not just about a theology. It's not just about a concept. It's about a God who's living and vibrant and touching every part of who I am. And when I get into that place where I become a brand new creation in Christ, experientially, I move to the place where I say, all that is within me, bless his holy name. I'll tell you how you get there. You get there. Actually, let me read the whole thing. If you have a look at, um, uh, where are we going here? John. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 says, But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I love when we come in and we have times of worship in here. But the worship it's speaking about there is not the singing that we have here. The worship it's speaking about there is the worship that goes back to the very first time that worship is mentioned in the Bible. And it's when Abraham is at the bottom of Mount Moriah with Isaac. And he says, the boy and I will go up and worship. The reference to worship in that context was about sacrifice. Sacrifice. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. What he's talking about is this. You have a choice to make as to what defines you. We can live from the natural dimension and it'll be my will. What I see, what I think, how I feel, what I choose. My behaviors, it's all about me. So I will be defined by the flesh. Alternatively, I could sit and say, it's more important for me to sacrifice my will because I want to discover his. But in discovering his will, it means I step outside of the flesh and I move into the spirit realm. And I sit and say, you know what? I want for you to show me who I am. And I want for you to not only define me, but to recreate me. So I become a spirit 
defined being. Not only in terms of who I am internally, but I begin to live from that place. I begin to be redefined from that place. I sacrifice myself and my will so that who he is can come in and redefine me. And he redefines me according to something called truth. Those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. What he's saying is those who worship me are those people who recognize my value and how important I am. And they say, and they say you know what? I will sacrifice my life for this because I want what you have. And when you come in and you redefine me, I become a brand new person experientially. And I'm not a person defined by my will or by the natural. I'm a person who's defined by the nature of God. And so in that place, I can sit and I can worship him in spirit and in truth because it's defined who I am. God's life is to be experiential for us. When God talks about the fruit of the spirit beginning to redefine us, can I show you one thing and then I'm finished? I just say somewhere. Colossians 1. Sorry, they don't have this, so I'll, I'll just read it to you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. I'm going to read it out of the NIV. It says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. So if they're praying for you, what are they praying for? So he tells us. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. If you don't know the will of God, I don't know what the next step is. Every time I discover the will of God, I know where I'm going. I know what, 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 what's in front of me. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Our ability to please God is very much dependent on the degree to which we value the life inside of us and we submit to its influence. We surrender to his will, not mine. I'm getting recreated. I'm getting defined by spirit. What is the result of that? Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. And being strengthened with all power. I think there's a sequence to that. The thing about it is, When we live a life worthy of him and we allow his will to define us, the first thing that happens is we start to bear fruit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forever. Carries on. That's the fruit of who it is. The point is this. When we start to bear the fruit of who it is, it starts to define who I am. When it starts to define who I am, I get to know who he is. In other words, I don't want to know God In my head that he is, we just use this example, so I'll go back to it, a God of peace. I don't want to know in my head he's a God of peace because that gives me some understanding. But it's not knowing. Knowing is when he defines me and peace becomes a part of who I am. There's a difference between understanding about God and knowing God. I can understand God when I read about the fruit of the Spirit in the natural realm, but I know God when I allow him to birth that on the inside of me. Now I walk in that knowledge every day. I walk in peace. I know what it is to know God. I live from this place. It's knowing God. When I move into that arena, it opens up an avenue because what it does is I begin to step into what it truly means to live a life of power. There is authority in that place, which is another whole thing, which I can't talk about today. So we'll speak about next week. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. And he just wants you to know how much he loves him. And he loves you. So we're at an interesting place. And we, in going forward, I have to make a decision about what becomes the determining influence in our life. Because unless I'm intentional about it, I will always default to natural, which means I'll continue to live from my understanding of God. 
which means I run a high risk of discovering the truths of God, but without the spirit and power. Basically, it translates into religion. That's what religion is. It's not that religion is necessarily uh, fundamentally wrong. That's why people get confused because they talk to you about stuff and what they're saying is right. Scripturally, it is correct. It's not a case of whether it's correct or not. It's a case of whether it's powerful or not. And so I can either continue down that road or I could sit and say, you know what? I want to veer off a little bit. And I want to take the road perhaps less traveled. And let's go down the road of exploring that spirit dimension thing. Maybe there's more to it than meets the eye. And so I'm not saying don't go and get into the word of God. I think you should because the word of God is wonderful because it's a menu. It speaks to you about possibilities, but don't rest with possibilities. It's like somebody who goes to the gym and they read about all the machines and what they do and how well it's going to work. And they're so informed, but it does nothing for them. The Bible will teach you so much, but until you actually get to the place where I'm able to engage him and have relationship, I can relate to him. And I, you're going to have to push in. I will tell you that. I don't, I, I've never met anybody. I think people have had like quick encounters with God and it was like something happened and it was like, I knew that that happened. But for people to develop a material, substantial and deep relationship with God never has come easy. All the people I ever listen to say the same things. You have to push through initially because it's like, this is hard. And it's like, I don't feel like I'm necessarily getting anywhere. And then I want to know what's for dinner because I'm just started thinking about it. And then I come back, to, I shouldn't be thinking about what's happening. I'm, I'm just at a young level. I'm just exploring stuff, but you stick with it. Stick with it. And what you'll discover over time is it gets easier and easier and it gets deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden you start to touch certain things and it's like, where did that come from? It will change your life. I'm going to speak next week. I think <laughs> I want to speak next week about the fact that because the life of God is on the inside of us, every part of our being needs to, needs to come alive as a result of that spiritually and how God wants to use every one of our faculties from a spiritual point of view to give us spiritual vibrancy in the way that we engage life. Let's pray. Father, I, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for your life and your goodness and your blessing. I want to thank you for your righteousness. I want to thank you for the gift that you've given us. It gives us the opportunity to redefine who we are according to who you are. It gives us the opportunity and empowers us to come against anything that resists a lifestyle that is committed and is congruent with who you are. I thank you, Father. I pray right now that you begin to open up opportunities for people to begin to recognize your will in situations and to grab a hold of that, hold on to it and move forward with that so that you can begin to redefine who we are. Father, we're no longer happy to be people who live with an understanding of you. We want to live with a life of you and alive on the inside of us, established on the inside of us. We want to go through life with a sense of knowing who you are. Let us live from a different place, I pray. I pray for the week ahead. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in every person's life here. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're touching people in the most incredible ways. I want to thank you that you're creating a new generation of people who are spiritual people, people who are spiritually minded, people who are connected and engaged with you, people who are surrendered, and people who are sacrificial in their way that they approach you and their disposition to you. I bless you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen.